Welcome everybody to Studio Insights with Bell Vista Studios. You got Hannah, Victoria, and me, Kim, and we are here to chat about things that we appreciate and recognize in each other that we want to learn for ourselves to improve and develop. Thank you everyone at home wherever you may be watching this video. We appreciate you watching them. We love getting all your messages of how it's adding value to your life. Keep sending them through and we'll keep having conversations like this. All right, first questionnaire, human quiz question person of the day. <laughs> I'll throw to Victoria. What you got, girl? Um, my question is for you, Kim, and it's kind of a follow on from last week. Um, so last week we were talking about decision making and how to Thank make you for reminding me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I kind of wanted to get more of an idea from you because it, I played out this week a bit when you're trying to decide what the best, uh, I guess solution is for a learner. What is some of the criteria you would use? Um, so we talked about last week using like the decision analysis matrix thing. Um, mm -hmm but you need criteria for that to work basically. So this week it came up when I was trying to decide a uh, design slide for a project. Um, and you kept saying to me, like think about what would be best for the learner. So for me to use that matrix, I therefore need to come up with like what criteria I'm gonna use to decide if it's best for the learner, like which decision is best for the learner. But what are the criteria like what are some examples of criteria you would use to determine that, to be able to put it on the matrix and make decisions? This chick, just <laughs> the toughies coming in to begin. All right, well, I've just done a little scribble to summarize what you're talking about, where you've got that the decision-making matrix. So we have ease versus impact, low, high, and then you plot your little things along like there and there this is not going where I think it is because it's like mirroring <laughs> and then you would <laughs> decide the, oh god <laughs> that one up there <laughs> is the one <laughs> and then you're saying but how do you get the criteria to know if the impact or the ease is yeah, yeah. what is it because you can just go oh it's easy and then mm -hmm. how easy is it all right yeah, yeah. Probably I was more uh, struggling thinking of the impact criteria because mm -hmm. for, I like I could determine that myself based on like my knowledge of my skills in yeah. um, but yeah I guess more around the impact for me okay how to determine impact criteria to make a decision so this is coming back at you two <laughs> and the audience at home but they're not going <laughs> to be giving you the answers <laughs> so what do we care about as instructional designers? What's our goal? Um, what changing behavior? Yeah. Good one. Um, engaging learners. What does engagement look like? Um, look like for them or for what we're doing? Like, is it making interactions or? yeah well that's what we're trying to work out I guess that's like one of the things is you say engaging but is it specific enough for us to measure mm -hmm. so that's why I went back and said what give me more what does engaging so you decide you can take it down engaging for the learner engaging for us um I would think maybe like including interactions okay realistic so <laughs> yep yep so I'll, I'm going to rephrase it you said it they're interactive that are realistic so I'm going to just say it real world mm -hmm. or like sorry replicate the real world so we use that language a lot in our team anything else mm, kind of feel free to jump in at any time <laughs> Right. <laughs> I don't think I need to. <laughs> um, maybe like the feedback we get from clients or users. Yeah. 
feedback, we'd need to break that down again. And the other, the risk with that one, I'm just going to put it out there, is that we wouldn't know that until the end of it. So mm -hmm. we'd need to prototype to be able to. So if we were doing a prototype, we would um, consider that as our impact and we'd measure that and then that would inform the solution that we go on with. Yeah. So I'll pause on feedback. Hannah, do you have any you want to add? Um, no, my, I think my main thing is helping change behaviour through making it replicate the real world. So I would want the learner to experience something that's as close to the real world environment as possible. Yeah. So that when they do it in the real world, they actually know what to do because it aligns. So that would be my top criteria, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think you've got it there already. So you're saying change behavior. I'm going to go deeper on that one, just like we did with um, engaging. So engaging became replicate the real world and mm -hmm. change behavior. I'm going to put it as action focused post the event. So post the e-learning, post the job aid. So they're doing something different afterwards in their role where they're having the opportunity to apply essentially. So I think like as instructional designers, that's kind of always our goal is those two things if we're trying to create good training. So now we have our two criteria is action focused post the event and does it replicate the real world? Mm -hmm. So then you're able to plot it based on the impact that you want to give for those two things, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. So how does that sit with you in terms of the question that you asked, Vic? Yeah, that does answer it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> now I'm going to put this into practice. <laughs> what are you going to do differently with this knowledge? Knowing uh, that <laughs> you forget things and <laughs> many things. <laughs> you, Victoria, <laughs> forget things. <laughs> nah. I don't mean it that way, but you've just learned a new thing. We've been always continuously saying, how do you learn things? You've got to experiment and you reflect and all that kind of stuff. So what is your plan post this event to take action? Um, well, I can already think of another opportunity in the project because I'm working on it later today. Mm. Where, like, Because I think we talked about it last week and then between talking about it and then me trying to put into practice I <laughs> forgot about uh, I wasn't going to go there but okay you did. <laughs> um so I think for me it is like I need to from this call I need to like have something in mind already where I can apply it because that will help reinforce because if we just talk about it and then like I go on with my life basically <laughs> <laughs> And then the next week I'm stuck on something like there's so much that's happened since then that I don't always remember the conversations. <laughs> I think I need to like reinforce it earlier, F like find a way that I can reinforce it earlier. Um, <laughs> to hopefully like start that new habit sooner instead of like just waiting and hoping something will come up right here. Yep, cool. So I still am not confident that you know how you're going to reinforce it yet. You've just said you're going to reinforce it, which sounds great, but we need to get more specific, right? We need to be action focused. So this is applicable to, <laughs> you're going to be sorry that you asked the question now and everyone's going to be very strategic in future of what questions and not come to Kim anymore. <laughs> if you think about a storyboard, we're trying to write content, we can be like, reinforce the behavior or like so high level. But it's not action focused, it's not practical, it's not a decision. So how are we helping learners? And in this instance, it's not specific enough. You were saying, I want to reinforce this so I don't forget it or I remember to do it next time. And that you put it into practice so that that impact is high. But right now, you, and this goes back to the conversation we had last time with Hannah, like that gap, she asked for scripts. So you're, it sounds like you need help to reinforce it. So do you know the answer to reinforce it or do you want to seek support? Well, because I want to use it in the project today. Mm -hmm. Is that 
Yeah. So how are you going to, I guess an example is how are you going to remember to apply it in that project that you're working on later today? Are you just hoping that your memory is going to hold on to it and that when you do the task, you'll be like, oh, it's time to apply that thing we spoke about earlier today. Or is there something else that's going to reinforce that behavior in you post this conversation? Same day thing. I'll remember it, but it's, <laughs> it's like weeks go by is when I forget. How would, would you remember it too? Like, what do you, what else would? <laughs> well, I, we work differently, so I don't know, like, the answer for you. Um, but if I just think about life right now, this is a conversation. It's probably going to go for another half an hour. We're going to talk about a lot of other things because I have a question. Anna has a question. So it's information overload. It sounds great right now. You only have one thing to remember. It's first thing in the morning. Like, nothing else has come up. But what's going to play out is a a conversation with more information you might get phone calls you'll be thinking about what you want to have for lunch you're going to get into implementing client feedback you'll be distracted so how can you best support yourself to remember it later today because this is the critical time for you to start applying and put it into practice so that it becomes a habit over time mm -hmm. so what support <laughs> systems can you put in place for yourself right now make a decision so that you remember later on to apply it to your task like set a reminder or something do you mean or say that again sorry it just cut out like set a reminder or something or yeah that could work i reckon set a reminder any other ideas well, not really because I wouldn't normally do anything like that so <laughs> if you guys do it how would you normally can I do because I have a process that I do yeah yeah so what I realized works for me recently is I use Milanote so I have it like I have a work side and a personal side and on my work side I put today's date and write down like everything I need to know for that day and that's really helped me so like in this conversation if we discuss something that would impact a task today I'd put it into the date for today and every time I do a task I go through that list and that's really helped me to remember like specific learnings and to ensure that I use it when I do the actual task so that works for me like writing lists but obviously everyone's different mm. yeah I think for me personally yeah I so I've got like my tablet, all the client projects, all the tasks. If I'm working on that today and something comes up, I write it down. So I remember I'm very just in time. I can't hold on to a lot of information. Um, so I, you know what, what I'm like, I'm like, hold on, I need to put it in my calendar. Um, and I'd put it in when I'm about to work on that task so that I can remember it just in time until it becomes a habit. So they're the things that work for me or if it's, or a post-it there that I remember <laughs> to apply it but then I for, after time I don't see the post-it anymore so it's not useful yeah all right well, then. <laughs> <laughs> so get that reinforcement down there set that reminder for yourself you'll experiment you'll decide you said you don't normally set reminders for yourself so you're going to experiment now and see if that works for your style of working and if it doesn't what are you going to do? That's me <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So would you know how to define criteria moving forward mm -hmm. to make a decision? Yeah. Well, I feel like what we came up with then is what I would usually need the criteria. Like that's the exact criteria I would usually be looking for anyway. Yeah, we have basically just created a little process for ourselves because impact for any of our instructional design tasks, when we're like creating a storyboard or a learning experience, it will be how can we create action post the event and how does this specific thing replicate the real world? So that will probably tend to be our impact moving forward. So all decisions, you just need to ask yourself, does it meet these two things? 
And yeah. if not, how do I make it do that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. Nice. Hannah Grennan, over to you. Okay, Victoria, you're being put on the hot seat again, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to know from you, Victoria. So you've been doing the human centered design coaching mm -hmm. offer. And what I would love to know, because I feel like I'm like, like I know the process so well, I don't know how it comes across to others because I've like, yeah, it's like a part of me now. So mm -hmm. I'd love to know from you what's been, could you talk about your experience of learning about human centered design? Um, like does the approach resonate with you as a learner? And are there any gaps? Um, I feel like so far it's all resonated. Like everything that we do just makes sense, basically. <laughs> and it, like, I think it's good because a lot of it is focused around like getting information from other people. It's not you struggling to like make sense of things or come up with things yourself or like make assumptions I guess about what you think should or shouldn't be included in mm. the creating um so like every activity we've done so far is speaking to like the like whether it's the client the users or like whoever the stakeholders are basically and getting all the information from them so you know that it's actually <laughs> um so I think that I feel like that is like the key to the whole process really is like, it's about the people who are actually involved. It's not up to you as some mm. random to make it all up as you go kind of thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, pretty much every activity is based around that. And then that gives you everything you need to be able to like to, like, to identify what changes need to be made and like how you can actually make them so that they'll be effective. Yeah. Um, so I guess the only thing, I wouldn't really call them gaps, but for me, just because it's a new process, um, I think the, um, the, like the things I've kind of struggled with is probably like the language to use, kind of what we were talking about last week with running workshops. Like, um, I feel like I do struggle, I guess, to come up with like the right, not scripts, but like the right things to say to get what you want, like when we are doing the different running ac different activities with stakeholders, um, yeah. how to phrase things, how to move people along, how to get more information, like all of that kind of thing. Um, but I guess it's hard as well because you can't, you don't want to like handhold people either. And there's a lot of people who already know that as well. Mm. Uh, like they know how to hold a meeting or like they can just kind of come up with that themselves and I'm sure I could eventually but it's kind of like when you're going into a new when you're doing something new you do kind of want to like as easy as possible <laughs> um so if I'm already focusing on like I don't know how this like I've never run this activity before I don't fully know how it works like I have all of that information but then you also need to think like when I walk into that room what do I actually need to say to people because you can't just get straight into it and be like question one blah blah like just all that like fluffy stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I think that applies to me with everything. Like even if it's just calling a client to ask for something, I'm always like, oh, what do I say? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I get nervous about it. Um, so yeah, I think that is, would be different for everyone. I wouldn't consider it a gap really. It's just like my personal experience. Yeah. But even like going through the process, I've tried to, I th like it is about preparation, I guess. You can't just walk in and assume that everything on the piece of paper is going to, that everything you need to know is like on a piece of paper. It's like it's a guide for you to follow and it has all of the steps you need to take, but it's still up to you to like flesh it out where you need to and take the time to prepare before you jump into it. So it could just be sit down for 10 minutes before and think like, how can I open this conversation? Like, what can I use as prompts just like refresh it in my head before I step into it because it is the language is stuff that I could probably come up with it's just like taking the time to think about it before you just mm. try to run something um like I'm capable of asking questions and <laughs> introducing myself and like uh setting the other people up for the 
activity because I know like why we're running it and what the purpose of it is but it's just like reminding yourself you need to actually share that with other people mm. that makes sense um but yeah it has, like it has been really good for me <laughs> to complete it I think because I do it does help me think about things differently um even though we always talk about human-centered design it's like this is what we really mean and I think getting a better understanding of why we do the things we do yeah like seeing it all play out it does understand like why it's important to hear that from a certain person or like ask that of someone or yeah get that information and use it I guess that answers everything no that's good I've got a follow-up question for you god (laughs) 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 so listening to what you're saying around like the language to use and knowing what to say like there's the process and then there's also that other element of like what am I going to say in the meeting and how am I going to phrase that what would you need as a learner to be confident in that space um I think for me it's just taking the time to prepare because I know the very first activity I ran from the playbook which was I did kind of just think oh yeah I've got the playbook I can just like follow that and I'll be fine but then I got in and I was like I can't just start like people have no idea why they're here or yeah. <laughs> I right into the activity I need to like explain to everyone why they're here for that mm. and then, like the next session I wanted to run before I went in I thought like what are people gonna like the people who are coming into this meeting um like do they know why they're here do they know what the purpose of this is mm. like would they be worried like nervous or worried about anything and then just like typing dot points of saying like before we start I need to like remind them of this this and this like I need to give them an updated copy of this um like kind of refresh their memory of the stuff we'd already done um and then like I just like wrote little prompts to myself as well like phrases I can use to say like the first thing we're doing is blah blah give them like a bit of background or whatever they need basically for the activity to make sense to them considering they've got 500 other things on their mind probably yeah. <laughs> I might not remember so for me I think it is just like that preparation time writing prompts if you need to so you know like the exact you still want it to like flow casually it's not like robotic like reading off a script but just to refresh in my mind like this is how I can say that that will hopefully make sense to everyone else mm. and get it from the start yeah mm. So yeah, I guess it, like that's the same with anything. If you want to be like confident in something, you do kind of need to until you get to the yeah. stage. Not really an effort because it's just yeah, yeah, awesome. I would like to bring you into this, Kim. So from what Victoria, from what you're saying, Victoria, I can really relate with you because I think it's similar to the question I was asking last week with mm-hmm. the workshops. So know the process and learn like these are the steps I have to follow, but there is that other element. And I think that's what I was trying to get across, but couldn't quite like, (laughs) and what you're saying, I'm like, that is what I was trying to say. I struggled to like, what am I actually going to say? And like, this is actually happening. What's, what am I going to do in that moment? Yeah. And from like, from your perspective, Kim, I'm just wondering, like with, for example, training me to run workshops and helping people run human-centered design workshops. Do you think we need to incorporate an element of what Victoria and I are saying is a bit of a gap? Or do you think that's something that people do in their own individual development time? Hmm. What is... What practical, if we go back to the criteria before, actions do we want people to take post our human-centered design cohorts? So they get the playbook, they do online learning, they get group coaching, and they get individual coaching to step them through the process. So what practical actions do we want them to take post that experience? 
Um, we want them to run human centered design activities to get the information that they need. So that would be their goal. Mm -hmm. um, we want them to create a solution that takes the learners and the stakeholders context into consideration. Mm -hmm. Human-centered design solution. Um, I guess like we want them to feel comfortable to adopt a human-centered design approach for their project. And that would include doing specific things that are listed in the, uh, the playbook. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to add anything, Vic? No. no. Cool. So what I'm hearing the outputs are is you're trained in a process hmm. and you're creating a solution that replicates the real world. Yeah. What you're identifying in terms, just let me process this for a moment, hold on. Um, so would you agree, I'm just gonna summarize what you're saying, would you agree that the, what you're looking to learn and develop in are facilitation skills for both of you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where I'm getting that from is that last week in the conversation and this week, it sounds like it is scripts. How can I open a workshop? How can I um, probe on questions? All that kind of stuff. So for me, that is facilitation skills. Mm. Would you agree? Yeah, I would. Do, is facilitation skills part of the behaviors that we are trying to train when it comes to human-centered design? I would say yes. Do we promise that though? You've just said that you want people to go through a process. So the activities, you want them to apply the playbook I think we do promise that. We talk about like you'll be confident to run workshops. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I've said that. <laughs> confident in running a discovery workshop, running user interviews. I think in order to do those things, which are the behaviors that we're wanting, facilitation does play a part of it because you need to know like if someone if a user or a stakeholder says something and you need to get more information from that or get to the core of what they're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. Like you do need to know how to facilitate that conversation and ask the right questions to get the information that you need. I think if we do, like if you're doing the course like I am where it includes the coaching though, that is like the, mm. Like I would ask you in the coaching, luckily because I was running my activities with you anyway, like we've kind of done the coaching that way. <laughs> but I guess the coaching is an opportunity for you to say, I'm about to run this workshop next week. What do I, what should I be saying? What kind of things can I say? I guess maybe only if you're only for the book. But again, sure most people, if they're competent to do the playbook on their own, they would not be there for a meeting. Maybe. I, I think, <laughs> I think this is highlighting with learning experiences. It's not a one size fits all approach. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about, oh, Kim's having a little giggle. She's like, duh. <laughs> or maybe she's not agreeing with me. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think like, it's made me think about the importance of having like coaching or reflection that's personal to that learner because like you were saying Victoria some people are confident to facilitate and do those things and other people aren't and I think that we shouldn't say that all of our learners are going to be the exact same every learner is different yeah and I think that just highlights the importance for me to design so learning solutions in a way that enable people to have that individual reflection and have like customized support 
So I think like coaching through a learning solution and having coaching available is like amazing if people can have that. Yeah. What do you guys think? <laughs> I agree with that. Cause I think it is like, I do need, I know that I need both. Mm. Him, apparently, if she was learning a new process, I think she knows my processes already. <laughs> but if she <laughs> new one I can't imagine she would need help knowing how to run oh like run that process with a group of stakeholders or whatever. Mm-hmm. whereas I'm like I need to exactly what to say yeah so, when him would probably like, this, like that part of the training is a waste of my time and potentially money yeah <laughs> whereas I would be like I'm going to use every millisecond <laughs> I'll be the same, I'll be like, that part is what I need. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's still quite difficult to read. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> <laughs> Any other revelations or <laughs> insights from? <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, Hannah, is Vic cutting out on your end? A little bit, yeah. Okay. She is on mine as well. So I just summarized Vic because you cut out a little bit, but I was making the links. But for people watching, you were saying that, for for example, all learners are different and have different needs, different levels, right? I've been doing instructional design a bit longer. So therefore, you're saying that I would potentially just need the playbook and could go run with it mm-hmm. and apply it. And my experience would be brought in. So I'd be able to decide how I'm going to run this, although I've been given a process. I'll put my own flair onto it based on just my experience and how I do things. You're yeah, saying yeah. because it's new to you, you would milk every single component. You'd want the playbook, the online learning, the coaching, the individual coaching, because you haven't got that experience yet. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. Okay. Um, so yeah, any other insights or revelations on what you've just revealed for yourselves? Um, well, I think I'm relating it to the learning solutions that we find and thinking like, are we providing learners with that opportunity? And if, I think it's just highlighted again, the importance of like supervisors, because if we, if it isn't in budget or it's not in scope to enable people to have coaching and ask personalized questions about their learning. I think their supervisor is like the next best person or probably the best person to provide them with that advice. So I think it's just reminded me of like the importance of those elements, which we don't always have, like, I can't think of the word, but we don't always have the ability to make supervisors be supportive. But I think it's a really important component of learning. And when the two and two go together, that's when like people do change their behavior. Influence is the word I was trying to think of. We don't always, I think we can have an influence, but ultimately it's not always in our control what happens in the learner's environment. We just like hand over the solution and we can try and have an impact and impact the culture and make little changes to their environment. But ultimately the support that they have around them does make a big difference. I think that's where I'm at with it. Hmm. Cool. What do you think, Kim? (laughs) I think you've just solved the question that you had for me (laughs) so (laughs) I'm glad that I (laughs) didn't have to no but you've just had the realization yourselves and that's why I think I don't believe it's a gap because as an instructional designer you may wear many hats and there are many skills and things in your toolkit right there's Addy there's Sam there's um action mapping, there's human centered design, there's storyboarding, there's facilitation, there's psychology. Um, there's all these kinds of things that come by within being an instructional designer. This course is not about teaching everything you need to know. It's about applying human centered design to instructional design. So mm-hmm. it's a niche. So we're not trying to solve all problems of an instructional designer. We're solving one problem and we're doing that really well. 
And that's what we focus on, right? Then you're right, like you revealed it yourselves. We, if you think about the solution, there is a process playbook. It's supported by online learning, right? It is, which includes role plays and we go into the scripting sort of stuff in that to a certain level. It then has the group coaching, which allows for social learning, learn from other people's stories, get everything out of there. And then the personal personalized coaching, you get the time specific to your individual needs. Now, why was it created that way? Why did we create our human centered design cohort like that? Because we applied instructional design, we applied human centered design. So when we did it back in the day, when we were conceptualizing where it came from was us identifying what our process is, how we do things, then we had to, I had to put it into a process to train you to. And then we're like, this is really good. This is working. We're getting good feedback from clients. It's helping you do, I'm seeing performance behavior change happen in you in how you apply things. There's something in this. Let's teach others. Then we started like having videos on YouTube and social media posts and writing blogs because we were learning, embedding our learning, applying, sharing. And then it became like, it just kind of evolved into this learning, blended learning experience. But what we did was a human centered design approach. We thought about what are the challenges? Where are the needs of people out there like us? Are they advanced? Are they intermediate? Are they beginner? We looked at the different personas. We did an empathy map. Like, I think we probably forget about it now because it's like a something sitting on the creator hub that just rolls out. But like we did all the hard work back in the day. And I think what that proves is, and this is the role of an instructional designer, is to take a complex thing and make it simple. So mm -hmm. now we have this sort of simple thing, like it's a blended eight week program. It has the four different components in that but we've taken it from years of experience and years of learning hundreds of thousands of things probably throughout like targeted learning and experience of learning, like going, throwing ourselves in the deep end to evolve this simple solution. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that's why it has things like the group coaching because we realize that not everyone that comes through the program is at the same level. They have different needs, different priorities at the time. So right now, like Hannah, you had just run a workshop and that's where this, I don't know how to facilitate kind of imposter <laughs> syndrome came from. Hmm. And then you'll work on that. And then you're going to have another need. And in some future conversation of this, you're going to say, is this a gap, Kim? And I'm going to go, well, this is a new priority for you as a learner because you have evolved. And if you were in that cohort, your experience, you'd be using the group coaching or your individual coaching to meet your specific needs where you are at. Yeah. And that's why it is that blended experience to meet people, human centered design. You summarized it really well earlier, Vic, was the whole thing is about going to the end, meet the heart of the solution meets the needs of the people we are designing for. And that is the way it's been designed. And that's why we can't solve all problems, but we can influence, like you say, Hannah, to the best of our ability. With yeah. the evidence that we have applied from a human centered design approach to get it to where it is. Boom. So where does this sit with you now to close off your initial question? <laughs> Which definitely evolved over time. Um, yeah, I think that sits well with me. I feel like so because I wanted to understand what it was like as a learner to learn that approach to see if we could do anything differently to help people yep. better adopt so the approach. improvement, you're iterating, yep. you're thinking, can we make it better? Yep. Yep. 
And from what I heard Victoria say, like the concept or the approach makes sense to her. It helps her get information from other people. It takes the pressure off her as the instructional designer or the developer to have to come up with everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes sense to her. So that part of it is working well from Victoria's feedback. Yep. But the yep. part that was missing was the facilitation part. Yeah. Through the discussion that we've just had, that's something that is different for every single learner. And that's where the coaching can yep. add value yep. to them. And which has played out because I know working with Victoria, we have coached you on the facilitation side of it. It's come up a little bit in the group coaching, but here's where it's going to play out, right? Victoria, your peers that are in your group coaching, what are their needs? What things do they bring up? Because they're different to yours. So if your needs are facilitation, the needs of your peers what have they been? There's been themes for them. They're at a um, different place, different priorities. Managing stakeholders in one, but mm-hmm. not necessarily in the, like facilitation, uh, like in terms of that more in general, like getting them to back on time and that kind of thing, actually getting the feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's more project management. I'm, mm-hmm. I'll label it under an umbrella. So we've got facilitation now we've got someone else an instructional designer that needs project management skills any Mm -hmm. what else is coming up um another one has been like organizing content one of the other Mm. a lot of uh, like she's got a massive book basically that she needs to uh, wow that's like how to condense that how to make it interactive that kind of thing that came up last week, I think. Yep. Um, so that's very specific instructional design skills. She's got a wealth, like so much content, a handbook. She's got legislation. She's um, participating in their, uh, like their face-to-face training because it's going online. She's having interviews with users. So she's got so much information and she's like, what's actually useful for me to create my learning? So you see just in three individuals there, very different needs. Mm. But would you say, Victoria, by sitting, you haven't necessarily identified for yourself that project management or identifying the right content is a gap for you. It, maybe you've mastered it or it's not a gap yet. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it's not, but that's why it's useful that, they're there because it brings up other issues that I could potentially have so I can learn like from their situation I don't have to wait until I'm like in the middle of it being like oh my god I don't know what to do (laughs) yeah (laughs) like through their experience I've already got yep so if we go back (laughs) it's a human-centered design course right we are teaching you the process of applying human-centered design to add as one component of your toolkit as an instructional designer. But there is facilitation, there's project management, there's storyboarding, there's low action mapping. There's so many other things that instructional designers are expected to do. We're not promising that. But if that comes up through your coaching, you get that. Mm. And if it comes up for others, like Victoria is saying, she doesn't realize that maybe she has a gap on project management we don't know but like maybe she's like oh in future when I do do that and when I have to manage stakeholders and tell them your feedback needs to be on time I'm going to apply that person's learning so it doesn't happen to me Mm. yeah that's cool it's made me realize that is like I already knew but that is such an epic course because it does give you the human centered design process, which we know works. And it also helps you become a better instructional designer through getting personalized support. It's like perfect. If you're an instructional designer, check it out. Seriously. (laughs) This is funny. This is not a paid advertisement. (laughs) I'm glad my own team is having this realization. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Um, 
and I guess the other thing, like you identified the <laughs> supervisors, <laughs> it's really important to have their support and influence in embedding the learning. So that is where <laughs> Studio Insights came from. You know, we're creating the space right now to further and embed your learning. For me to challenge you on the questions that you ask, the things that you are experimenting with, to hear it 50 billion times <laughs> and, hope, <laughs> and hope that one way that it's said differently sinks in. It's like, <laughs> This is your blended learning experience as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so would you like My to summarize? What was that? My mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to reinforce this mind blowing behavior. <laughs> How are you gonna do that, Hannah? I'd like you to change your behavior, whatever that you've identified for yourself. What is the change in behavior that you would like to reinforce for yourself post the answer to your question? Well, I think, I don't know if it's a change in behavior, but Not you interested. Me. I'm only interested in the impact <laughs> that changes behavior. <laughs> According to my criteria I identified earlier. <laughs> well, I feel like it'll help. Oh God. I feel like sometimes you need a change in like how I know I'm going back to emotions and I always go back to emotions, but I feel like the way that I feel about the human centered design course, something has definitely just clicked where I'm like, it makes even more sense to me now. And I feel like that feeling is going to help me more confidently support people through that experience. Mm -hmm. And it's given me confidence that it works. So I think that will change my behavior in the way that I interact with people around that experience mm -hmm. and help them be better. Cause there was that missing component for me where I'm like, for me and for Victoria, and I know it would be for others as well, that there's like a part missing. And I was like, how am I going to help people with that missing component? If even I am trying to learn it myself, but I can see now that like we're helping them with that process, which we know is epic. And then there's also that opportunity to help them with their specific needs, which could be project management. It could be um, facilitation. And I think all of us in this team can offer something different and we're all evolving in those things. So we do have value that we can give to people who go and sign up for that course. Is that an action for you? Is that enough of an action? Well, do you think that you can do something different as a result is the question. <laughs> With your answer, does that reinforce your behavior? Yeah, I think I it'll help me. I think it'll specifically help me in the coaching. So if I'm... Vic, you cut out, so we'll have to come back to what Oh, sorry, Vic. <laughs> He's cutting out every time you say like, out again. all we hear is like the and <laughs> type it in the chat <laughs> I can read Victoria's mind I'll just say it on her behalf okay what you're saying it's like it's breakfast time <laughs> cut the conversation <laughs> yeah I think it's, the process has become clear in my head so I feel like specific to the coaching sessions in those coaching sessions, I know how to handle people, handle the problems that people have and know what I can specifically support with and what other members of the team can support with. And I feel like we have a lot of value to offer as a team and that we can, we cover what instructional designers need. I feel like as a team, we get, we can give people what they need. Cool. Okay. So what I'm hearing is you are confident that it's a good learning experience and you can support people afterwards. Yeah. So you went from a place of not feeling confident. I, I would call it a lack of self-belief 
an imposter syndrome coming through. Yeah, but, that's what it yeah. is. Yeah, I'm confident in the process, but I, for my ability to support people with the process and the other things that come with it, there was a bit of like, oh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, Still so confidence. lack of confidence slash imposter syndrome in the HCD experience. Now you're like, you've gone, oh God, like I feel really good about this. It is epic. I'm still not hearing how you're going to reinforce that this is epic and I can support learners through that. Like it's sitting there. Like I said to Vic, this is the same thing as Vic earlier. She didn't have a practical thing to reinforce her behavior. So what's your practical thing that you're going to ensure reinforces this confidence and this renewal of fuck yeah, this is epic. And I can support learners to the best of my ability. How are you going to hold on to that feeling when you are coaching people? Mm, so yeah, I've just realized a gap now because I've put myself in the situation. And I'm thinking like, because I'm being like a fly on the wall, imagining what would happen. So mm -hmm. say I had a coaching call with someone in the program. And they said to me, look, like the human centered design approach makes sense. So I, my confidence lies in the, like the human centered design approach. If a learner said to me, the approach, approach makes sense to me, but like, I'm not very good at facilitation and I don't think I'm going to be able to do the discovery workshop. I think you're going to talk about two different things now. I don't know if you're going to answer my question. You're, you're identifying your learner gap yeah for something else now yeah but can we just focus on oh God, right. now, i need to reinforce you need to reinforce for yourself what you've just had an epiphany about so that the next time you are you're like that oh this is epic and i feel good about it i feel confident in my role to go do it to apply your learning that you've just had now in your job about the whole HCD experience, how are you going to reinforce that feeling of confidence? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> Do you have any ideas for her, Vic? Mm. No. I don't know. <laughs> sitting <laughs> yeah i was thinking yeah. yeah yeah so remember the next time that you yeah. ever yeah. yourself is you're going to re-watch this video and watch yourself have an epiphany and go it's just i've just realized this is actually the best experience yeah and you're going to relive that emotion because you, emotion is what you said is important to you you're going to relive that emotion, those feelings, and then go forward with that applied. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Then if we went deeper, we'd need to figure out how you're going to remember, which is probably going to be me going, Hannah, go watch that YouTube video of yeah. where you had that epiphany and then come back to me if you got any issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when that imposter syndrome comes in, Go yeah. watch our YouTube video where you have just outlet like lived that experience. Yeah. That epiphany moment for yourself where the emotion kicked in, the penny dropped, whatever that, you know, descriptor is for you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Does that sound like it will change your behavior? Yeah. Can I ask oh, one more question? Hold on one second. Will that change your behavior? Yes. Okay. Yep, ask your question. <laughs> so I've just got one gap to fill and then I feel like I'll be able to move forward and be more confident with this. Yep. Um, if, a, if someone in the program asked you something that you didn't know the answer to, what would you say back to them? Give me a script. What would you say back to them, Hannah? Oh, no, I'm asking you. Think about it. I don't know. <laughs> That's what I'd say. <laughs> and they'd be like, I've paid for this experience and you can't help me. 
Cool. Do you know everything in the world? I don't think everyone knows everything in the world, but I think you need to be helpful in some way if you're helping someone learn something. You think that you're not helpful? Well, someone asked me how to facilitate and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> that to me is the definition of unhelpful. Are you expected to have all the answers? No. Does anyone have all the answers? No. Do I have all the answers? No. <laughs> but what do you say <laughs> so you're not like shutting them off and not helping them? What did you just say a minute Ooh. ago? I don't know. Like, I know it's like the only thing I can think of is saying like this program or this experience is around human centered design. And that's where I can best help you. Like that's where my skills are most aligned to. It sounds like you're wanting support in facilitation. And then it's like blank. <laughs> That sounds like what I say, idea. like I potentially you could speak to Kim because she's really good at facilitation or you like Christo is someone that I watch on YouTube. You could check out. Is that what you would say? Something that sounds really helpful. <laughs> so you just share what you do know and make it clear that's like, that's not where my skills lie. But what I recommend is you could do this, like these are the actions you could take to get the information that you need. Sounds really helpful. Yep. <laughs> and if you have no, like if you have no recommendations of the actions they could take, what do you do? You just say. What do you say, Anna? Well, I don't know. That's where I get stuck and nervous because I'm like, I'm not adding value if I don't know. Can you know everything there is to know? <laughs> no. So you just say, I don't know. Sorry. That's see ya. See ya, see ya. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why can't you say, I don't know? I don't know because I feel like it's not very helpful if someone's like, signed up for an experience where we're supposed to be supporting them and helping them are we supporting and helping yeah but we're not supporting and helping them to every single problem that they have in their lives or every single problem that they have as an instructional designer it's not what we're promising in any way and yeah. we are helping to the best of our ability always there's, is there any doubt in your mind that you're in that's what you got praised for last week when we asked Victoria, what can we recognize Hannah for? That she always is there and goes above and beyond to help to the best of her ability. That's a value. That's an identity of who you are. That's all we can ask for, for you to be as helpful as possible with the knowledge that you have. I have no doubt that you'll ever not do that. I could put you in any situation, either of you, and trust that you will help to the best of your ability. And I don't expect you to have all the answers. Yeah, okay. Because we don't always, you've said it. How can we be expected to have all the answers? But yeah. what we do know is we're gonna be as helpful as possible. And at some point that help cuts off. Yeah. I also kind of think if they're in the HCD coaching, like if it's in a HCD coaching pool and they ask you something that you don't know or have no suggestions for, it would make me think like, why did I actually need to know this? Like what is... You definitely put yeah. off there. <laughs> it sounded really amazing. <laughs> I the last part of that. Yeah. Well, so so they're in the HCD like... course and... <laughs> well, I don't, I think it's going to keep cutting out. So there's maybe no point in it. <laughs> no, it 
sounded like really valuable and helpful. <laughs> was it why do they need to know the question? Is that what you were saying? Well, yeah, if they're asking a question in that coaching and you don't, and it's like you'd assume it's about the process, right? You know the process. Yeah. But if it's something you do and it's something you have no suggestions for, it would make me think, is it relevant to your process? or is it relevant to like, because you have instructional design knowledge as well. Yeah. Are they just asking some random question that's got nothing really to do with anything? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does <laughs> yeah. make sense. Well, it reminds me of what you do, Kim, when we ask questions, like you seek to understand how that question is actually going to help us and make us think about the question that we're asking. Like, if you have absolutely no idea what the answer is, what, like, how has that happened? How have they come up with that? When you have, like, no supporting knowledge at all about it and can't draw on, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I think you'd always be able to suggest something. Yeah. As a last resort, <laughs> Google. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. All right. Well, that question went <laughs> many different directions. That was lovely. Thank you, both of you. <laughs> that was really good. Cool. Okay. My question. <laughs> I think you've answered my question, actually. Actually, I shouldn't assume. Was um, for both of you, mm -hmm. reflect on where you're currently at and what one practical tip do you have for yourself to put into practice? Well, my practical tip is setting reminders because I feel like where I'm at, I have lots of <laughs> knowledge and tools I need, but I do not remember any of them when I need them. Like I forget almost everything that I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true but um cool so you're going to set reminders to help you start reinforcing the behavior until they become a habit yeah cool um I think for me it's around like having the confidence to like I think I could do more and add more value if I just like believed in myself a bit more, a bit more, which sounds like super, yeah, like self-help sort of video, but <laughs> <it's> definitely like, <laughs> and I'm wondering, like, I'm trying to think of an action I can take to get me into that mindset. Cause right now I feel really good. Like, I'm like, yeah, like I could like deal with any coaching session or whatever. Cause like I'm, I'm feeling the emotion of the conversation we're having. Mm-hmm. So I think it is, I don't know if it's watching this video, like I'd need to test if that would work. Mm -hmm. Watching this video back. I think that's the first thing I'm going to test. Because I don't know if like affirmations or anything like that would work for me, but I feel like it'll unlock like another level of what I can offer if I push through that barrier of like confidence. And so I'll just test the watching this video back and see if that helps. And if not, I'll revisit it and think of something else. Um, okay, so everything that you guys are experiencing is not unique to you and the many people that watch this video will also be facing things like imposter syndrome and not having confidence in their ability from time to time. And it's not like you feel like this all the time, you just go through highs and lows and it's not unique, it's just being a human being. I do it as well. Sometimes I think the things that we have on the creator hub, I'm like, oh my God, are we asking for money for these things? And like, maybe we should just make everything free. And then I go and look at the things and I'm like, holy shit, like that is so good. And if I had that when I started, how more advanced and how quicker I would have got there. So then it does that imposter syndrome, that thing, the lack of confidence in what we're putting out there into the world is I go, no. Nah like it is epic and sometimes we just need to 
have a little boost of self-confidence. So what you're feeling, it's a human being experience and it happens all the time. I feel like we could actually just delve way deeper into this conversation, but I just think it's information overload. So I'm going to park it unless you guys want to continue this conversation. I think that's enough for me for now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have spoken about a lot of things in this video. We have spoken about how to make decisions. I'm going to do a refresher because <laughs> it's gone all over the place. <laughs> so what did I learn? Um, how to make decisions. You use an ease and impact matrix. We did bring it up in the other one. If you rewind the video, you'll see my squiggles where I was trying to like do the reverse and plot things and how to do criteria for that. So how to break down specific criteria, make sure it is specific so that something happens at the end of it. Engaging is like a, what is engaging? If you can't clearly define it and explain it maybe to a five-year-old, it's not enough. Um, that we applied human-centered design to our human-centered design experiences that we offer. Um, that everyone experiences imposter syndrome and lacks confidence from time to time and that it's okay. What else? What do you guys have in summary? Um, I think that's it for me. I think it was just like the realization that we have our process and there's lots of other things that people are going to have require personal advice for and it just reinforced the importance of coaching and supervisors being involved with their employees and helping them like deal with their specific issues mm -hmm. so I think that was a big insight for me yeah yeah this reinforcement I guess that was like that was my question coming in it was just interesting that you had or I had well actually I was probably primed to ask for what's your reinforcement behavior but you need to whatever you've got from this people at home and you two you need to reinforce behaviors. We know that as an instructional designer, so we need to apply that to the things that we're learning ourselves. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, team, for being open to develop and being curious. And thank you for watching, everyone. We are at Vista Studios. We are doing live development, <laughs> and we hope that it adds value to you. Please share it with anyone that you think may um, get value as well from this video, and have an awesome day.